artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. We're just catching up. Welcome to the school, Maria. Just, um, we wait a little bit for people to arrive, if you don't mind. And by the way, this is a bit of a quid pro quo because Maria Upfield had me as a visiting something or other at her fine establishment of pedagogy just, just a little bit ago. So we are in reverse roles now. Tables are churned. <laughs> the tables are turned. Does my blurred background help everyone not understand that that's a microwave right there? Does that... Is that, is that helpful? <laughs> so obviously a microwave. Is it, it can, it's not like an abstract painting? No. no? Yeah, I was kind of like starting to feel like you're rivaling me with my gray background. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. I'm gonna show you my son's Legos real quick. Or am I? I can't seem to get through the blur. Well, listen, everybody, it's about time. So I am Nato Thompson and welcome to the Visiting Artist Talk. Thank you, Teresa and Amber, our team here at the school and welcoming you. Uh, Maria Helpfield, you are our first visiting artist of the semester, first semester of 2022. Everyone, let's give Maria Helpfield a round of applause for being bold and courageous. Hey! Hey! That's great. Um, we, I wanna just give you guys a sense of how these are gonna work. Um, as you, you know, you've been at the school, so you know, but we're going to, um, oh, this is how it works. Amber, good job. Yeah, like this style. <laughs> this feels like some sort of CNN newsroom thing or something. Um, we're gonna have a conversation for about 30 minutes. I like to keep it snappy. When I worked at Mass Mocha, the director, Joe Thompson said to me about artist talks, keep them wanting more. And I thought, well, that's just a great idea about most things in life. I often say about art, you know, it's art when you really need to leave, but you can't. <laughs> Jokes. Uh, I shouldn't say negative things about art right off the bat. I don't mean it. I love it. I love art. I live art, breathe art. And we, I'm so honored. It's not an accident. We got Maria Upfield first. Um, and then we're going to do a talk for 30 minutes. We'll do a little interview. Hopefully Maria will show us a little bit. Maybe what, maybe drag something off her wall. I don't know. Um, and then we'll leave it to you guys to ask some questions for about 15 minutes. Um, and then we follow up these visiting artist talks with a um, tea time. And that's for the artists at the school to decompress, to also just be social. Sometimes it can be awkward, but often it's convivial. And it's just a way for you guys to get to know each other and not just be getting to know the artists in your, your whatever classes you're in, but to be a mixer. And for those that have been here, around here a while, Cloudy, Wendy, Lexa, Amber, Teresa, we bring in the new folks because we know that there's a real community here at the school and we really appreciate you uh, being a part of it. So without further ado, let me introduce Maria Hupfield. Um, hold on, I got a bio that I, oh my God, somewhere, here we go, nice. All right, Maria, if you don't mind me doing the kind of officious thing. Maria Hupfield is a transdisciplinary artist working in performance and media arts. Um, she was awarded the, Hina oh my God, the Hanatian Foundation Award for Outstanding Achievement by Canadian Mid-Career Artists and Lucas Artist Fellowship in Visual Arts, Architecture, Design, Montalvo Art Center. Hupfield is a guest curator for the Artists of Color Council Movement and Research at Judson Church, Winter 2020, and inaugural resident of the Surf Point Foundation Residency 2020. I'm taking this off the Fairless Center. Um, Art Center for Art and Politics, which I love very much, by the way. Maria's practice works is, is interdisciplinary. Um, and she works in a kind of um, tradition. She's from the Anishabi tribe. You'll uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this. And is also pulled on those cultural traditions in terms of decentering time, positioning art coming from decolonialism, interested in memory, but also re, you know, just reconstituting what constitutes art and memory and culture utilizing the space of contemporary to dig digger into deeper ideas that are beyond just the gallery and museum. And with that, and I had the pleasure of both working with her at the Creative Time Summit in Toronto, as well as at the Seattle Art Fair. We've done two things together and that's been great. 
So without further ado, welcome, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> so before we get into your practice, I always like to start with something rather prosaic. We are in the midst of a pandemic and you are an artist. And I always think it's good to acknowledge the times that we are in and that, you know, the personal is political. How, has, how are things going for you in, in the midst of all this? Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big question. I, I think that, um, first of all, I can't complain. It's going very well. I'm, uh, you know, I, I teach at the University of Toronto. Um, and so, you know, I moved here right before the pandemic happened. So there's that. And then I've re been able to receive a lot of acknowledgement and support around my practice before the pandemic. So, um, yeah, I've had a lot of projects stop, you know, I'm not doing the things I thought, uh, which can be hard when you feel like you've had momentum around your career, but then there's been a lot of other things that have appeared and are pushing me in all kinds of directions and making me think about my work in new ways. Um, you know, I was really into being online before the pandemic. And now I feel like I have a lot of, there's a lot of resistance around certain things. Yeah. Um, but I, I enjoyed hearing you speak about the school. And I was so curious. So when you invited me, I'm like, absolutely. I want to come meet these folks and find out what's going on. I think there's a whole other pedagogy around teaching online and even what's a course evaluation look like for online teaching, right? Um, but anyway, yeah. So as an artist, I can't really complain. There's been some good stuff. Um, right now, it's a tough time because a lot of the projects, like you mentioned, the Surf, Surf Point residency, it didn't happen, but it's going to happen. And now they're inviting me to schedule that at the same time. Other thing, new projects are happening. So there's this moment where things are really coming and um, piling up, right? So trying to sort through um sort through everything. Well, let's, um, you know, it's interesting. I, it hadn't occurred to me until you just mentioned it, but, you know, certainly the last documenta, I just want to kind of feature that. Lord, I can't remember the year that occurred because um, we're all in Rip Van Winkle. Time has stood still at this moment. But um, but I, 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 the last documenta featured Indigenous culture prominently. And, you know, I know that, you know, I'm, I don't want to be crass about this, but there was a deep interest Indigenous in Indigenous cultural production from vast sectors of the art world, particularly Australia, but also Canada, where you're at has you know had a longer history of Canada and Australia in general in terms of supporting this cultural practice with its own problematic legacies. But I said you know I suspect you were getting a lot of energy from the kind of contemporary art world that also I suspect when the pandemic came, put a, you know that pause was probably pretty um, well just severe because you were also kind of rising up with the, that kind of moment. Let me ask you something as an artist that was working clearly way before then, you know, I would like to hear about, you know, your interest in what you were working on early on, and then also what, what you're working on as the kind of interest galvanized towards your practice, because it is a mixed blessing when you're like, I'm doing the same things, and now there's suddenly interest in me. Where have you been for the last 15 years? For sure. Yeah. Um... You know, I feel like as an artist, I've always been the kind of um, maker who just made stuff, you know, stuff I wanted to do. And I, you know, I've, I've always been in this um, for the long run. So it's been about building up a strong foundation of materials, you know, sorting things out for myself. Uh, so, which I think has helped me as well, because I'm not the sort of artist that came on the scene and everyone was like, Maria, you know, it wasn't a big splash. It's been a really slow, long build up for a number of reasons, um, which I would probably say really have mostly to do with sexism in the arts, right? <laughs> um, and ageism as well um, for, you know, for women artists. Um, and then also combined with that, you're absolutely right about the Indigenous part because that's confusing for people and they're so it's so misunderstood and such little is known about it and everyone it's all imagination like someone has this idea that's based on some crazy thing um, so that's always kind of worked against me so I've had to 
really navigate how to position my work every step of the way. Um, and now I'm at another moment. So I'm kind of crazy. I, I don't feel like sometimes people are like, what was your career plan? And I feel like it's not, it's my own plan. It worked for me. It's working for me, but I wouldn't recommend it. Right. <laughs> I think I graduated, I moved to the West coast. I was teaching and then I left the West coast. So um, being native, I left my territory for another territory where I'm not considered people are, they're not familiar with my kind of native art, right? Or my reference points. So I was out of my element, but I didn't care. And then I, I went to, cause I wanted to know what they're doing. And then I was like, what are these guys doing down in New York? Let's go check this out. So I went down to New York and that was like, New York is a place where New York is just about New York. They're like, we don't care what you do. You're from Canada. We don't care. And I remember my first year in New York being at the symposium at the Museum of the American Indian and being like, I want to hear what the U.S. has to say. I want the, to meet these Native artists. And what they did was they brought all these Canadians who I knew down to New York and basically they presented. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm trying to get away from these, this, you know, these folks. I want to know what the Native artists in New York are doing uh -huh. and the other artists. So my time in New York was very, very different because it allowed me to immerse myself in performance with the performance art community of Brooklyn. So that was good. Um, but in terms of once people, I, you know, I'm still dreaming about things I want to do and I have to slow myself down because I'm like, I want, I want to show it the witty. I want to, you know, like I'm thinking really, you know, there's all kinds of things I want to do. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of my peers like really go up and I'm like, hey, hey, like I want to, I want to do that too. You know, I'm like, I want to go to the Venice Biennale. I want all of that. I'm excited about it. Um, so that let me ask, hey Maria, let me ask you something about cultural reference points and leaving your territory because I think that's both a physical question, but also I think it's like just such an important kind of um, question of power and legibility that like is so essential. And I know that we were you we you know that is it's ingrained into your work a lot, but it's it's a, you know there's I mean I, I always tell this story, but it's really boring, which is I had this uh, poetry teacher that I said, what if I make poems that only I understand? And the poetry teacher said, well, those are the best poems. You just have to keep them to yourself. But it's a different kind of story when it's a, it's a story that you and your community understand that's separate from the one around it. And so, you know, you've worked in a kind of legibility that's really, you know, uh, that's really legible to a certain community that you also through New York understand using different sign systems and symbols to sew together a sort of mixed translation of images and, and performativities to register with people. How have you, you know, are there, how, how has that conversation evolved in your thoughts over time in terms of the kind of way you work? Yeah, good question. So um, I think a lot of my work, are, you know, I feel like this is a good question to ask maybe like my peers, people have been around me, what they thought. I, um, I don't know. Like, I'm enough just of, in it. Enough of that. Like, I'm, yeah, I feel really in it. So from my side, I feel like I confused people early in my career, because as you can see, I'm working with industrial felt, and that's not a material that Native people work with, right? I love it. For me, it gives me a lot of freedom. Um, I came to it through sound. I was working with these other um, tin jingles. Um, so it confused people because I wasn't working with birch bark. I wasn't doing beadwork. I wasn't wearing regalia. And I also didn't want to do that because I didn't want to um, basically commodify my culture. Right. But there's still a lot of other references in my work. So as you can see, like these, fringe, you don't get any more native than fringe, right? So <laughs> you think I'm using fringe. I think it's pretty obvious, but um, yeah. So I like the, the felt because it lets me be, align myself and work in a way that I'm used to through sewing. Um, and refer other ref cultural references, but at the same time exists as a contemporary artist because we all know industrial felt is associated with modernism, right? right. So it, it gave me this entry point. I mean, when I hear felt, I think boys right off the bat. I go, Joseph boys. But I mean, yeah. I, I don't know if he's the only one. Oh, it's the one that's, where, that's my go-to. 
absolutely and you know it's but it's also like he's a man he's german yeah. he came to it through this whole myth he like he was like my life's so boring i have to make up a myth about myself to be interesting that he referenced from indigenous people and so i'm like well maybe because i was in canada and not and i knew of it but i didn't feel that arching history of him i felt like why not of course i can work with this because mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who do are often paying tribute to him and that's not how i'm working with felt so i feel like there's space for me to like boldly work um, with this as a material um in terms of that maybe just to kind of shift a little gear i always like to hear what artists are working on right now as well like what can maybe you can describe a project and also you know since we're not doing slideshows or anything it's always good for the artists who's here i like hearing about your materials what you're what you're kind of how you think as a kind of practice you know yeah i'm working on a on a bunch of stuff i'm trying to um i have a show up right now which includes a lot of um objects i've worn in performances so wearables um because i've been thinking how do i display these items that i usually perform in um whether it's sculpturally so um initially i didn't want to use a lot of traditional display techniques because i felt like it fixed and historicized my work whereas i want my work to look alive like someone's that and to be aware that a living person made it to mm -hmm. imagine it being worn and used so i, I love to, that yeah come up with different you can strategies. feel that when you see it you feel the the lived in this versus the the alienating pristineness i suppose is what you're yeah thinking. and in fact that kind of wear and tear only adds to my work so the more times i wear it the more times i perform in it um but that's not to say i don't make work that's sculptural so right now i have like my laptop on what's basically let's see if i can show you a part of it. i can show you a, a foot <laughs> um, I'm making a silhouette with um, felt floral motif on it and it's a whole it's my outline and it's covered with I guess it kind of like a floral tattoo but it's obviously like this relief that I'm just stitching in place hmm. um, so that's a project I'm working on right now that has been a long time in coming and then at the same time I have here I'll grab this oh my god I love this um, do you guys like her just grabbing stuff from the studio? It's the best. Like, <laughs> oh, <it's all> there. <laughs> this other piece, which is a uh, like hand cut oh, cool. circle floral motif that's um, using the negative space. So it's the reverse, right? It's more like the, the silhouette is a relief. Um, but at the same time, I also use a lot of um, accent my work with a lot of fluorescent yellow as like a visibility and to help the give it is a that bit yellow of a or i mean some people think it's green but it's just like fluorescent yellow i okay. use it like i have a over here a little chair with yellow but so i'm like i just made this i'm showing you all work i haven't shown yet but <laughs> it's fresh from the studio awesome uh, I made this pouch, this bag. Uh -huh. Um, you know, so it's like well, that's cool. It's basically like a pattern that I folded into three. Um, so this is typically what I do when I perform is I'll enter and I have everything on me that I'm gonna perform in. So I'm making this like kick-ass purse that I'll wear in a performance that has this pattern and so these references are really coming out of having returned home uh -huh. and thinking about medicines and balance and being balanced and my own well-being and even this is a abstraction of a um water pattern that you would see on historical um anishinaabe pouches and i like that it uh to me it looks urban and now and it doesn't historicize right? right it doesn't fix it in the past so these are all kinds of overlapping references but it's taken a long time to get people to catch up to what i'm doing where they can talk about it so the exhibition i have right now on wearables is the first time someone has talked about felt like 
which seems ridiculous, but how I use felt, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you so have I'm, a, with your yeah. shows, just a question too, like, do you have a struggle with how much wall text or explanatory text a curator oh or someone puts in there and how much you feel should be left for the imagination? And like, yeah. like it must be a bit of a, I mean, I'm just imagining. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I um, have a hard relationship to with labels. So I don't want to be didactic. I don't want, so I'll just share. Sometimes I curate. So I curated a show called The First Water is the Body at the New Jersey Art Center, where I invited, it was a group exhibition. They wanted me to do a show on Native women. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that, but I'll do a show on water. So I invited all Native women <laughs> to submit work right. on water, yeah, yeah, I got you. Um, which has all these other like cultural references. Like there's this, you know, gender BS in Anishabe that women are water carriers and men are fire protectors. So anyway, there's all these like, right, which I challenged. But when I, it, the first thing I said when I saw the space was, I don't want labels. Mm -hmm. I only want, a floor plan for this exhibition. And then once the work started coming in, the director came up to me and said, Maria, we're gonna need labels. And Jason, so my husband Jason and I were like, someone got to them. Like someone got to them and said, people are not gonna understand this show. They're gonna be, and she was saying this to me herself. And this is after she agreed, absolutely Maria, no, I'm against labels as well. But she said, people aren't gonna understand a Jean Quick to see Smith work that has like, literally it had a, a rain poncho. They're not gonna understand the connection to water because of the native element. Like for some reason that confused, confused them, right? Added all this confusion. Um, so yeah, I do, I do have a real hard relationship with it um, to the point where I've, even made a performance um, called Absent Presence that was um, the score included four labels from my work from different institutions where I went in with a Sharpie and altered the score and then performed for each of those objects in the space. Um, and so just in general too, I mean, I just love to know a little bit more. I'm switching top. We don't have a lot of time, so I just jump around. <laughs> By the way, you know, as someone that worked in museums, on the flip end, it's always tricky to negotiate with artists around wall text too, because I'm always sometimes like, but I don't think they're gonna know what's going on. I'm really like afraid. Um, so I don't know. It is a struggle. I feel you. All right. So, um, <laughs> so what? Um, in terms of your studio practice, are you? Is that you? What is your? Can I just ask? Because in my class, where I was talking about like what people's practice is. Do you work every day in your studio? Do you? Are you, do you make everything yourself? What's your practice like? Yeah, so I, um, part of teaching is that I have a studio space on campus called the Indigenous Creation Studio. So it's this radical idea. Usually there's like a research lab, but I'm saying a studio is a lab. Sure. Um, so I'm positioning it that way. So I work with students in that space around research that I'm doing. Um, to connect it to place, plants, all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, so I do, I have that work, which has been all online because of the pandemic. But for my own studio time, like Jace, my husband Jason and I share a studio, we're in downtown Toronto in Chinatown. Um, it's a great space. We have our storage here and he's here every day and I'm here as much as I possibly can be. So generally it's like, two full days. Um, it's really within walking distance of my house, but I also um, have an office at my home where I'll do, you know, administrative work. So like um, contracts, sending in, um, you know, applications, all that kind of stuff. So I've been trying, what I've been working through at this point is bringing all these different parts together so that my research, my teaching, my studio work is all coming from my practice. So Love that's- um, well, 
Yeah. It's just as a final thing too, and then we'll ask for questions, but there's a bigger one, but just to kind of a sense, you know, I know, you know, everyone doesn't want to be pigeonholed as an identity, let alone as an Anishabi artist. You get grouped in with things. And it's I'm sure it's a mixed bag like every mixed back bag like everyone, where it's like, I don't want to be pigeonholed as a woman, even though I identify as a female and understand patriarchy by that lens. And I feel like just as a question to you, because you've seen the art, you understand the art world from many vantage points. You obviously teach a lot, which is its own infrastructure with good and bad blended into it. But I wanted to just kind of ask what kind of world or ways you see your practice emerging, things you've learned, not only as an individual artist, but as an individual artist that believes in a certain kind of cultural positionality. Um, what's exciting you? What do you think needs to be fixed? Well, you know, something I've always just um, thought of is that there isn't, first of all, one way of being an artist. There's many ways. And we can, through our role as, through my role of being an artist, there's multiple things I can do, whether it's advocate for community through exhibitions, thinking about people I hire, whether it's a research student, how to um, mentor, all of those things in terms of legacy building, um, the impact an exhibition can have at that moment in time, how I can influence programming. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of being like all those identities in the 70s, there was a real um, thing between people, you know, the first Native artist that was purchased by the National Gallery of Canada, um, Carl Beam, saying that he, he didn't want to be seen as a Native artist or the first Native art, artist who was purchased by the gallery. He just wanted to be an artist. So I think there, there have been these conversations, but um, at this point in time, I feel like you can be all of that, yeah. right? But the the battle I've really taken on for myself has been insisting that I can be an artist, yeah. that yeah. I can be an artist that's not seen as interchangeable with other Native women or other Native artists, that people think of me, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, Maria does unusual stuff with felt, right? <laughs> like she'll do some story kind of thing. We don't really know what's going on. It's really innovative. Um, I often, you know, collaborate with other people. One of the, my collaborators, Charlene Vickers, when we collaborate, Charlene says, I just love that we got together and did all this crazy stuff in downtown Santa Fe, you know, or that we went into New York and did this. So the story of the performance you know, half the time we're kind of like, ah, oh, that makes me feel so joyful and happy. And also the story of it's so crazy. So just wanting to have the freedom mm -hmm. to do all of that. So sometimes, yeah, I think it's really important to be in group shows with other Native artists, to be present and part of that. But it's not to say that that's the only thing I can do. But it's also that I can have my own separate, you know, that I can also have a solo and people will write about it and talk about it, or that I can make this um, bag that might be seen as performance and art, but it's also functional and utilitarian. Maybe it's craft, right? That can be all of that. And that's how I really describe my work also. I've been positioning it not as like thinking the difference between the performance art and performing art, our performance art and the performing arts, but rather that those both could be seen as story work, mm. that they can both. So expanding the idea of what art can be through indigenous knowledge and indigenous, you know, the dance, the song, the ceremony, the story, the object, all of that, uh, rather than stripping away the context that we can actually include it and be better for it. Um, yeah. I love that. Um, and thanks for that. And I was thinking also about the different lenses that one could put on work. Certainly something that comes up a lot at the school that I hear is healing as a lens or caring or the, the lens yeah. of care as opposed to contemporary art, that these different lenses you place give a different set of uh, priorities, different kind of historical, a gendered or racial kind of composition. So, you know, storytelling is an interesting kind of lens to kind of interpret a work from that is not so disciplinarily driven, I suppose. Yeah, and Joanne Archibald has written a whole book on Indigenous story work, and part of 
um, what she talks about with that term is by calling it story work, she's acknowledging that the work that's involved with that versus something like storytelling or mm. coming from oral tradition, people don't really understand what that is because of colonial history. But to say story work Ooh. kind of opens up these other um, imaginings. You get a little labor in there. Yeah, this yeah. Is, <laughs> work it. Come on, Maria, help. work it. All right, so I get the story work. Um, so I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, hey, so let's get some questions from our killer attending artists. I, um, I think maybe Amber, should we switch the view or something or how does that work? Yeah, I can go back to gallery view. Just give me a Okay, minute. cool, let's do that. Cause like, there's, it's a good enough crew. We can just kind of, I'll do the gallery view too. So I don't have to see my big face. Um, and feel free to chime in or just raise your hand or whatever. Feel free to ask something. If you guys are still just seeing the speaker too, just look in your upper uh, right hand right. corner, the view button the gallery and switch view. to gallery and you'll be able to see everybody again. It takes a little time because that would always is. I have a question, but I don't know if I can articulate it the right way because it's something I'm dwelling on and I, I can't resolve and it's difficult to say, but I hope, you know, maybe you can help me with that, Maria. I, um, so I was a very bad student. Uh, I, I'm in Italy and uh, I'm at the moment, I'm looking into the um, Greek archetypes. Um, I don't know if anybody knows about them. Do you know anything about those? Uh, does anybody remember them? Like the female and male archetype, like, um, I don't know, Ven Venus, Mars, you know, all those. Sure, the um, gods? Yeah, the gods, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't like to call them like that, but yes, the gods. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons, that's how I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm really struggling because, you know, like I, I'm, I'm catching up on them because I thought them so boring when I was a kid and at school you have to study them and I never did really. And so now I find myself catching up on them, but I still like that I cannot make sense of them. Um, although I have to, because they so much have influenced, you know, Western culture and therefore they are the archetypes who have colonized, uh, you know, everybody's mind basically. Um, and so I find myself arguing a lot with a teacher or, or the person who runs the course saying, oh, those are the, archetypes and that's you know all we got and you know and i'm trying to bring in you know what about other cultures you know how would for example native american cultures or you know first nations um what kind of archetypes do they have and how is it that we never talk about them and how much have they been influenced by this you know greek mythology um i don't know does that make sense i don't know just like a big question i guess yeah yeah, I mean, there's a whole amazing, um, a whole amazing other belief systems um, in Indigenous communities. So, you know, there's over 500 nations. And in fact, the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian has an exhibition called the Infinity of Nations, because they acknowledge that there was an infinity of Indigenous nations in the Americas prior to colonial history and contact that we don't know, because so many nations have been um, through genocide removed. But um, like, so for example, this bag I've made, um, and I've done other work where it's like the spiral poncho and then you wear it so you can wear the spiral and that's supposed to represent the surface of the water. Like as I'm learning, as I'm reconnecting with all these belief systems. Um, but this bag, the design is referencing the creature whose name we do not speak of, underwater panther, who has another name that I'm not gonna say. And when I would talk about that as a cultural ambassador at the Smithsonian, I would, um, to help people understand, I'd say that person, like that um, being um, made sense for people who live by the Great Lakes. Of course, we have a yeah. creature of water. And um, I would refer to him as that was our Poseidon, right? Because people couldn't believe this underwater panther. And I'm like, well, it was, a, it was our Poseidon, right? So absolutely, there is so much. And I think that's part of the trauma and grief that a lot of 
um, indigenous communities feel today around things like residential school and so much, you know, actually that um, it's only been in, you know, like the late Carl Beam, who was the first indigenous artist collected by the National Gallery of Canada, was the same age as my mother. So that's only one generation ago that we actually started to collect native art in the National Gallery of Canada, right? I don't even know what that is in the US. So yeah, that his it that trauma and that loss is really there, and there are still knowledge keepers. But finding a lot of the vocabulary around that is super useful. Uh, as a visual artist, I don't always feel like my role is to educate people by laying that out. Thus, why I resist the labels, <laughs> but it's there. So if an Anishinaabe comes in who knows that, it's there for them. And it's like a sign or a signal to them, right? Um, that That's the best way that I've been able to reconcile it because I feel like there's some things that I can make. I can make a jingle dress, but I'm not going to put it in an art show and sell it or sell it through my dealer. I would wear it at a powwow, right? Like that would be my mine. So there's a lot of different um, things, I boundaries I draw for myself. And we're also in a different moment where artists coming up now have another relationship to all of that and they're having different answers so Thanks so much for that Does anybody else got some great thought things cloudy for that mm -hmm. hi maria thanks for your uh talk it was lovely um i was interested in how how did you find felt as a medium and what was the kind of like material calling for you to that um, because it seems like it's really stuck with you for a long period of time and you've really identified with it. And I'm curious about that story of, yeah, your discovery of that and kind of journey sure. with it. Yeah, so let me just see. I might have uh, something here. Now, well, I don't have one handy, but I, I came to it through sound. So we have, actually, I do have something. It's not quite the same, but. Um, so these are jingles, little copper jingles. And there's another version of this, which is like a tin jingle that would be worn on a traditional Anishinaabe woman's jingle dress. And the idea is, that that was a healing dress. You know, there's a whole story about it that happened during the um, Spanish influenza. Um, there was a dream. And so I wanted to work with the jingle, but I didn't want to make a jingle dress. So I made a pair of boots with jingles on them. And that's when I first used felt. I used the felt to make the boot. Um, Cause I wanted, I didn't want it to make sound. It could support itself. Um, and I was doing a res after that, I started doing a residency at the Museum of Art and Design. And at the time they were using industrial felt for all of their display. And they said, Maria, you can have our leftover felt. Um, and they hooked me up with their supplier. And I just fell in love with it because you can get it like in all different thicknesses, like something as thin as this, different densities, but you can also get it super thick, right? And it's just like working with wood, except I could sew it together. So um, yeah, that's why. I, and also it's, I love this mid value gray, like you can get it in every, all kinds of other colors. Um, you can get black, white, whatever, but I love the gray because it's uh, monochromatic or it's, you know, it's more like a, it's sculptural. There's a, you can see the value. Um, it's more like a drawing. It's kind of like graphite. Um, I do a lot of drawing or I did a lot of, I used to do a lot of drawing as well. So that was how I came to it. But then I saw another um, Tanya, I'm forgetting her last name, but she had a show with felt like felting and she had white and black wool and she had people rub it on her body to make this whole form and it ended up being gray and it was a combination of those of course right <laughs> that came this whole suit 
And I just love that. Um, I was like, oh yeah, of course, like the gray is taking that. I mean, this is industrial felt, but it does point to like the wool. Um, as is that Tanya Bergera? Yes, yes, I think. She teaches here. Oh. Sometimes. Oh no, not Tanya Bergera. Um, the other. Oh. Um, I remember she did that big fuzzy outfit. <laughs> the big fuzzy outfit, sorry. Yeah, I'll not. check that out. Let me look for the big fuzzy outfit. Yeah, yeah another. <laughs> yeah, the other Tanya who did a, she had a show at the Museum of Art and Design not too long ago, but it's, yeah, she's a lot of design hybrid stuff. Um, but anyway, that's how I came to the felt. Um, yeah. Anyone other else chiming in? Come on. We got a good crew here. Feel free to be biographic and talk about your own practice. Oh yeah. I mean, Maria, look at this crew. This is not your typical art school. I love it. You love it? I love it. I don't know. This is dope. People are cool. So do you sell your, so you, I imagine that you sell your artwork or how does that work? How, how do you feel? I mean, I don't know, I just. Yeah, let's talk money, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. need like, <laughs> like it was like the practical size of art. <laughs> Good question. The one so, that I tried to avoid. <laughs> so yeah, when I moved to New York, like so I was in a, a relationship and I was like, he either he had to come live with me in Vancouver or I'd come and live with him in Brooklyn. And I decided I could take a leave of absence at work, blah blah. It's always after you live in New York, anywhere, it's always a step up. So it feel like it'll help you no matter where you go. So it felt like the right thing. But also um, it was a bold move for me because it was a way of um, showing I'm serious as an artist, but also to get some attention in Canada, right? Because I was when you're in your home country, they don't pay attention to you. Um, I'm, yeah, so anyway, so I, I left thinking that would would help and it did help because I was it that's how I got my gallery in Montreal and so I would do a lot of sales and that's how I supported myself in Brooklyn was I would be like yeah sell this if you can sell it, I gotta make my rent I gotta keep my studio open um and that was really you know um so I was really into that and it, I think if I was and he would take whatever and he'd be like, whatever you got, Maria, I'll sell it. And it was at the point where if I had a show or something in New York um, and they weren't selling it, I'd get upset because he'd be like, send it to me, I'll sell it, send it to me. Because that's the way, you know, there's different um, economies happening, different visibility. Um, when you're, as you probably know, when you're in a place, like when you're an artist in New York, you're in, there's so many other artists you're seen interchangeably with or who you're around. So it's a bigger pool to get noticed. Um, and actually by being in Canada, it's now serving me even better in New York because now I'm exotic Canadian artist, right? <laughs> Not just another performance artist doing something. <laughs> in Brooklyn. Um, so yeah, I, I work with stuff and some stuff I hold on to because I'm not done with it. So like I've had, like I've had this hammer for a long time and it's appeared and, and I'm rethinking how to use it, maybe do have it in a video. Um, and other stuff I'm like, I think I'm done with it and then I'll sell it. So when I made that jingle spiral, I took some photos and I'm like, I'm never going to wear it. So I sold it. And then we made a condition around the, the sale of it, where we said, you can buy it so long as Maria can borrow it back or perform with it in the future. And then when I had a show in 2017 at the power plant, we put that to test and we said, we want to borrow it. And they're like, of course, but of course they imagined I would come and perform in it in their gala, you know, at this Montreal Contemporary Art Center. But we're like, no, we want, we had to get a truck, pick it up, drive it to this festival. And then my sister, Deanne wore it um, because it was a collaborative performance. And then it was on display in the exhibition. So I've, um, because I, I'm, 
really looking at these contracts and how can I continue to connect them to community and to people um, and build that into the contract. So that's something I'm, I'm looking at. Um, the other thing that happens a lot with my work is people want to touch it when it's on display because it's so tactile. So one of the um, directors who I know said, well, what if I do multiples or have an exhibition, um, a display version that's only for display and then have a separate piece that then gets sold so that that way I don't have to worry about things getting damaged. So those are the kinds of things I'm considering and conversations I'm having around display of my, my work. Yeah. Great. Well, listen. Go, no, no, go. Is that you, Laura? Yeah, I was just wondering, like the bag that you presented is, some, is something that I could see so many people wanting. Do you ever think about turning any of these things into like a larger scale production that um, many people could own? You know, I haven't. Um, I do have, a, like my sister Deanne is a competition powwow dancer and um, fashion designer. So I feel like I'm always looking, getting and an entrepreneur. So I'm always getting support from her on these things. Uh, and there's a big indigenous um, fashion movement right now that's happening that I've at times have been like, oh, I wanna come wear my jingle boots on the catwalk or whatever it's called, boardwalk or no, catwalk. Uh, but I haven't gone that far. No, I think I'm still really caught up in the studio and. Um, I've done a few different types of bags, but, and I also have collaborated with a woman here in Toronto who works with industrial felt um, as a, you know, as industrial, like as design. So she does a lot of that work. Like she'll make little like um, boxes out of felt and that. Um, so I know that's available, but I haven't quite gone that route of even like um, doing like the, the digital print. I'm still like hand cutting things out, but that could be, um, I'm not to say, not to say I wouldn't do that. I think it would depend on the project. Mm. Yeah. It'd probably be very specialty limited edition something maybe. What's your favorite way of documenting your performance work or does that vary based on the performance? That's so hard. That's a really good question. Um, I had, I, I've gone through a few different attempts with video from like working with a video person who storyboarded it and did a lot of edits and it was for the camera to like, um, but I, no, I do have a way. So my preference is um, one shot, one take with a fixed camera, long shot. Mm -hmm. That's what I like. Yeah. Yeah. It's always tricky, right? Because the um, video, it's never like the real thing, is it? The no. documentation. It's no. really hard to capture the energy. Yeah. The other thing I've actually been thinking about, I've been working a lot with a poet um, and she has me thinking about like speaking and, but the other thing I've been thinking about is um, the possibility of hiring a few people who function as witness and then they write their experience of the performance so that we have multiple takes on one performance. So, and I think that fits with this idea of oral tradition where we often think of the game, um, the telephone game, where if we hear the same story over time, it breaks down, but that's actually not the case. Like when you're, when you're from an oral tradition, you're, you're taught, like you actually learn how to tell a story. So it's the exact same story that's been told since time immemorial. So like ancestors upon ancestors, it's the same story. So the story doesn't change. What changes, so as the person, the listener, we change, our relationship to the story changes. Um, so it's possible that we all see the same thing but have very different experiences. So this is something I'm thinking about around the, also this idea of storytelling. So we'll see. Um, so don't be surprised if a, a future, um, once I'm allowed back in the gallery to, or to do public performance, that's the direction. Um, it's interesting, I you know, 
we have a professor Miguel Lopez who did a, does a lot of He's an art historian, does a lot of queer and indigenous art histories, but he talked about patterning as a way of time travel, that tradition is a way of moving radically through time. And that to go to your point about storytelling, the ability, you know, so much of contemporary art and the avant-garde is all about breaking from the past to, to such a degree that one doesn't understand notions of continuity through time. And it's really powerful what you're saying, that ability to learn how to say the exact thing, I'm just totally like mesmerized by what you just said. It's really fascinating. Yeah, that's a lot of the research. I, so I'm cross-appointed with English and drama. So I've been looking into a lot of story, story work and these other oral tradition and thinking about even objects as um, telling a story or telling something or sharing something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, Maria, I think we all are just sitting here stupefied in awe of your awesomeness. So thank you for being like that. And it's very, thank you. Let's give a round of applause, everybody. How great are you? Thanks everyone for coming. Um, and thanks for inviting us literally into your studio. Uh, it feels like we're there with you. Um, we'd love to have you back at the school. Thanks for being uh, involved in our community. Um, and uh, we invite everyone to come over to Tea Time. Tea, can you say a little bit about Tea Time too? Thank you so much, Maria. It's so great to hear about more about your work. Um, yes, everyone is welcome to, you have to leave and come back. So pop, pop out of this one and go back on Mighty Networks and click on Tea Time. And uh, you're welcome to join us to chat, maybe grab yourself a cup of tea or depending on what time it is, a glass of wine, a cup of coffee. And um, yeah, we hope to see you in, in chat then. Thanks again, Maria. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Maria. You. Thanks, everybody. Ednado, do I go to tea time? You're, invi um, you're invited if you want to go. Um, we could send you the link, right, guys? Yeah, we yeah. could. I have, have another I have another meeting at three. That's why I just wanted to check. It's oh, a, you you have to, you're not obligated. You're not obligated. I told you what you're obligated to do. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. Thank you, Amber. Yeah, thanks so much, Thank Maria. You, Maria. So great. We'll do more. I love yeah. that. Across time zones. Totally. Yeah. Always. <laughs> okay, go. Have a good day. Okay. Bye. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world, teaching artists around.